Molt bon dia a tothom. Gràcies per ser aquí un altre cop i gràcies per venir tant d'hora. Comencem la segona jornada del Tech Spirit Barcelona, l'esdeveniment que considerem el pal de paller de l'ecosistema d'emprenedoria i startups a Barcelona i a Catalunya. Good morning. Thank you all for being here again today. Uh, in this fourth year of Tech Spirit Barcelona, the backbone of the technological and digital ecosystem in Barcelona. It's also the 10th anniversary of, of Tech Barcelona, so there's a party afterwards in, in the afternoon. Stay tuned because we are going to blow some candles in this party um, to celebrate the birthday of Tech Barcelona. So these days uh, we're watching on the stage local heroes, startup and also entrepreneurs. And and also, why not? Maybe some future unicorns. Some of you are starting, some of you are already experts, but all of you are ready and willing to share your knowledge, which is super generous, so thank you all. Let's begin. Yesterday we talked very thoroughly about investments. Today we're starting talking about health. These first two sessions today are held by Biocat, and so we want to welcome Monse Daban from Biocat. It's a pleasure to have you again this year, Monse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being here so early. Um, we have to apologize because we are just scheduling a very interesting, utterly interesting uh, speech really early in the morning. So thank you for coming. Um, thank you again for uh, having us here in this amazing stage for the third year, actually. Um, uh, I'm Monse Daban. I'm at Biocat, and we are the the cluster organization that um, drives the innovation healthcare ecosystem in Catalonia, the bioregion. Uh, today, uh, we will talk also about AI. I know that yesterday you were, there were many, many references to AI. Now we are talking to AI and health, mostly, but not only. Because now there's this uh, new uh, act on AI at EU level that was just uh, approved by the Council and the Parliament uh, a few days ago, uh, an act that was presented by the Commission in 2021. And this is good news because it's about making it safe, it's about making it also under the EU values, and it's about making also uh, stimulating the investment and the innovation in AI, so this is good news. And to talk about that, and to talk about this risk-based, let's also think that uh, under this AI Act, um, healthcare is probably high risk. It's medium risk, high risk, or unacceptable risk. So most developments under uh, healthcare are in the high risk. So um, the AI application in healthcare is driving the growth of the sector also. Uh, it's a sector that in 2023 it's about worldwide having like um, over 46 billion US dollars and is expected to have, to have over 102 US billion dollars uh, by 2028 and actually most of it is going to happen in Asia. So this first EU act on AI is going to be very important because it's going to set a little bit what's safe, what's unacceptable, um, and what's have, what has to be um, taken with transparency and managed with transparency, which is what happens in AI and health. So let me just go to that uh, because also I want to mention that Catalan government, the health department of the Catalan government, has set a steering committee on AI and health for the program AI Health. Uh, Biocat is proud to be there also. So there's a lot to talk about that. For us, if AI is driven in healthcare by software, by probably the big amount of data, the, big, um, the, the, the growing storage capacities, and the devices that are being created, we have a question there that we want to address the speaker, I will introduce him later, and the panel. We always say that AI is transforming healthcare. We want to ask now, is healthcare, healthcare needs transforming AI? And probably we will see that in the panel, this is what happens actually. For that, I will ask um, Bjorn to join me in the, um, in the stage. Bjorn uh, Arvidsson is a esteemed friend of ours, is a partner in projects. He is the managing director at Stuns Life Science, which is a cluster organization in Uppsala, one of the, one of the most dynamic ecosystems in health in, in Sweden. Um, and he is pioneering the change. This is the title of this session, Pioneering the Change. Why? Because he is talking about how cross-sectorial uh, approaches transform the landscape. 
He also talks about organizational changes, how to better support this transformation from cluster organizations. And he is also going to talk a little bit on what is doing Sweden to lead this change, this transformation. So um, I want to add that he defines himself as a self-educated lobbyist. <laughs> so please, Bjorn, do your magic, inspire us. And I leave the floor to thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks for being here. Um, so my name is Bjorn Arvidsson. Thank you. And thank you, Monsa. I hope that I can live up to all these words. So um, I come from Uppsala in Sweden. Uh, any Swedes in the room? No? Okay. Any Nordics people? I know one at least. Okay, perfect. So it's quite far from here. Uh, just the other week we had minus 20 degrees in Uppsala and I come here and we have 20 degrees. So it's a bit different. Um, Uppsala is a classic old uh, university city. It's very small. It's only 244,000 inhabitants. Um, and while we have a lot of students though, um, and we're connected to, to several Nobel laureates over time, not all of them are in tech or, or health, of course. We're very strong since way back in life science, clean tech and ICT, and I will talk a bit more about that when I come to it. Um, but you're all welcome to Uppsala, and you come to Uppsala, connect with me, and I, I can show you around. So I always like to start uh, back in time, why we came to be where we are. Um, I don't know how much you know about Sweden, but Sweden is a very sparse country. It's a very large country, actually, and it's very few inhabitants in the country has always been. So, but we have strong resources, though. We always had resources in terms of wood, ore, and minerals. So we could, you know, harvest those kind of uh, resources and make money out of it. In the beginning, we harvest the resources and we sold it, and it was kind of fruitful. Um, but we also, you know, being less connected, being a large country and so on, it was difficult to, to make a good trade out of it. And at the same time, we had a very weak nobility. So when our nobility wanted to tax us, we just moved further up north all the time to avoid paying taxes. It was not until the nobility actually gave us roads and marketplaces that we actually agreed to pay some taxes. And after that, things started to happen, you know. Um, and when we left um, the fields from the agriculture to move into the factories, this was also a time when we realized that we can't just, you know, um, sell the resources and buy back the products. We need to produce the products ourselves. So we started to train and educate our people and we built a lot of factories and we started to use the resources on our own and produce materials and goods out of it and selling it, becoming a richer and richer country. But after a while, you all know the history, it was cheaper to do this kind of production elsewhere in the world and then buy back the product. So when Swedes looked into that, we saw that it, it was cheaper. Uh, however, if we do that, uh, it will create an unemployment, you know, if we can't do something else. But we had a very well-educated people, so we um, moved on to aim towards more high technology instead. Uh, because in high technology, you can get a high price for it, so we can increase the salaries, we can stay or become more rich as a country, and still use the skills that we already have. So, you might reckon a few of the brands from, from Sweden. Um, Volvo, for instance, represents the car industry or mobility industry, and, and we also had Saab for a long time. It was a very high technology company, um, and they are also drivers in the field of uh, you know electricity or electric electrification of cars and so on. But it's not just about the company, it's also about the system around them. Uh, no company can exist without a good ecosystem. And becoming a strong brand like this, you need a strong ecosystem. It's the same thing with Ericsson. Ericsson moved on from early 20th century. There was, you know, phones. It was very early with phones, and then it moved into more telecom, and then it moved into mobile phones, and now it's 5G, 6G, and so on. So Ericsson is very strong today because they have transformed their company. And then we have, of course, AstraZeneca. We, in Uppsala, we had Pharmacia, pharma companies. They're also very dependent on a well-educated um, population and strong ecosystems. And also, you know, as I said, when you have a very cold winter, when everything freezes and you have a kind of warm summers and so on, you, you become very good at adapting to change. And I think also that's why the Nordic countries are always on top three, top five in terms of the most innovative countries and so on. But we also need to use that in, in a clever way. So what about Uppsala then? 
Uh, this is three years old. It's a, it's a report from the Nordic uh, Innovation uh, where they actually stated that Uppsala is the, the region after the capital regions that has the best possibilities for growth. Um, and why is that? The reason is that we have these strong universities. They say one large university, we actually have two. And then a strong driving sector, the life science sector, where I'm representing. And then we have a high proportion of very well-educated people. Actually, in the adult population in Uppsala, 3.8% is actually having a PhD, so that's a lot, I have to say. And then we have huge investments in, in research and development. But we should not forget the proximity to the capital region of Stockholm and the international airport of Uppsala, or, or Arlanda. Also, going back in history, um, this fellow, Olof Rudbeck, he was actually, he made the first Swedish scientific discovery. Uh, he discovered the lymphatic system in our body. And prior to him, actually, even if we had universities since 1477, the university was only about training priests. But in the 17th century, they started to do research, especially in the medical field, botany and anatomy, which is the, f the core foundation of life science and some pharma industry. Um, and he was also polymath, so he also, you know, made a, many other engineering products like, you know, water pumping systems in the city, he created a city grid, he also made compasses for the navy and so on and so forth. Um, on the other hand, we have a more modern side of Uppsala and Sweden. Uh, this is Niklas Sandström. He was actually first forming a company called Casa. I don't know if anyone is old enough to use Casa, but Casa was one of the early peer-to-peer -peer companies. Um, and he moved on later on to, to start a company called Skype, which you might have known about. Uh, and Skype was later sold to Sun Microsystems. And now, uh, sorry, Skype was sold to eBay. And now it's actually what's included in the Teams uh, program when you do your video conferencing and so on. He's investing in a lot of tech companies, but we also in Uppsala, we had MySQL um, companies also good in, in creating databases, and they sold that system to, uh, to Sun, and then later on Oracle is having that system. So the combination of long tradition in life science, medicine, botany, anatomy, and the more modern you know, culture of tech and if we look at whole Sweden, especially Stockholm area, we are also very strong in tech, you know, companies like Spotify, Klarna, Mojang, King, and so on. So there's a lot of skill, there's a lot of investments into it. At the same time, it's, we all need to address as well, there's a lot of societal challenges out here. You know, we all know about the energy crisis. You know, we have a war very close to our borders, uh, several wars actually. And we had just, you know, recently gone through a pandemic. I'm not sure we, we're out of it yet. Um, but we also learned through, during the pandemic that, um, you know, working together and also, you know, that life science it could be the key to solve similar uh, global challenges. And thus, it also created inflation. So we need to work in a new way in order to address those challenges as well. And if you ask European Union, where we're all part of, they will say that there are two paths to this. Uh, one is uh, the sustainability path, and the other is the digital transformation. And preferably, they should be combined and work together. So this is the twin transition that's talked about a lot. And you also know that we often talk about this, that we are in the midst of something that is mentioned as the fourth industrial revolution. If I mention in the Swedish history the first industrial revolution, the second one was with electricity, and the third one was when we moved on from analog to digital. But now we're in the fourth industrial revolution where we create a new convergence between technical, biological, and digital technologies, and it creates new rules, actually. Uh, and it also creates a war of competences. So to staying ahead of competition when you need more skills for the fourth industrial revolution. You need to compete with every city, all parts of the world, and in every sector. So, me who represents life science and health, then how can we be attractive in Uppsala for these kind of competences to make sure that we can stay ahead of the game? We, we can, of course, educate them ourselves, but you all know that we need to be more connected to be able to, to solve those kind of things. And it's the same thing. We see shorter life cycles, you know, the turnaround time of innovation is much faster. Even if we're frustrated as entrepreneurs or salespeople, we want it to be used much faster. But it is, you know, the pace is, is increasing. And we also see the convergence, you know. It's not just that the people move between the different sectors. We also see that sectors are, you know, somehow closer to each other than they were for a few, a few years back. If we look at health as well, just 100 years back, you know, 100 years back, 
Health was about surgery, mechanical care, the knife cures, we said. Uh, everything was about surgery. And then later on in the 20th century, it moved on to pills, drugs, medicine. Uh, and then a bit later in the 60s, 70s, it was more of an electronic healthcare with x-rays and early computers and stuff like that. While I hope that we at least are in an era now that healthcare is data-driven. Um, and we also, in that case, to be able to do that, we, we, we have the possibility to go from what I call eminence-based health to, to evidence-based health, um, and I hope really that we can all agree on that. We're also in a situation in terms of health where it's not really distinguished between if you're healthy or sick. You're probably in between all the time. Um, and when you uh, see yourself as sick and you approach health care or primary care or something else, that's often because you see a symptom. But before you have the symptom, you're probably not healthy anyhow. You know, we all carry a lot of things that could be inflammatory stuff, uh, chronic diseases, stuff like that, that we don't really see. But we're pushed over the border and we, we seek health care. But we don't take care of the root causes of our unhealth. So and I think this is important because we will probably spend the next 30 years looking more into what we can do to prevent being sick. There will be a lot of discussion about data. Probably you talked about data yesterday as well. Uh, I think it's important to, to remember that this is uh, Buck Minister Fuller. He, he's, he, he stated what he called the knowledge doubling curve. Um, if you can somehow measure the amount of information in the world, uh, he said that in the, in the early 20th century, we doubled the amount of information every 100 years. But after the Second World War, we doubled the amount of information in the world every 25 years. And then approximately now where we are, we're doubling the amount of information every year. And what does that mean? That means that we create as much information this year that we have been doing for the whole human history. And next year we will do it even double it again. So we produce a lot of data. So how can we make sure that we use that data to, to a better uh, purpose? And it's the same thing, you know, exponential growth as well, we can see within, you know, computational power, learnings, educations, how we uh, merge different kinds of technological advances to, instead of having a linear growth, we have an exponential growth, you know. And very soon we all agree that computational power will surpass the human mind in terms of computing, and when it does, it, it becomes very valuable. So we will reach a point where uh, we can have a uh, higher power using technology to solve complex problems and also hopefully take care of all those data uh, and the information that we could do, uh, create. So, is this opportunities for tech? Definitely. Is it opportunities for health and health tech? I would say definitely. And there are some drivers too that I would like to go into that I would say is opportunities for health and tech. Uh, and some of those drivers are that for instance, the classic diagnostic development is very slow. Uh, creating an analyzer that you can use in the, in the healthcare setting, either as a, as a benchtop thing or in the central lab, it takes years. Uh, you need to prove a lot of evidence, uh, and it's very expensive also as well. Um, pharma development, we shouldn't talk about it, you know. It takes many years, it costs almost 2 billion euro to create one drug if you can go all the way. And with, within nine years, it will cost a double the amount. So pharma takes a long time. On the other hand, we also know that we pay a lot for medical services and healthcare services. If you see it as healthcare pays a lot, it sounds like a bad thing. But if you see it from an entrepreneurial point of view, it's a good thing because there is a lot of money out there in health. Uh, if people pay more for healthcare services and governments, regions, uh, healthcare settings pay more for healthcare, that's a good market, right? So, uh, and at the same time, as we said, health related data increases very fast. At the same time, uh, software development, both cost and time, is, is decreasing. And electronic innovations, electronics in general, is decreasing in cost and, and time to produce. So it creates a gap. And this gap is the opportunity that we see. You know, If we have all these green things going in one direction and the cost to, to do that is going in another direction, the opportunities are increasing in that gap. And that's where, where you are, or I hope that where you will be. So how are we going to do this? Um, it's not that easy to have convergence between different sectors or thematics. Um, 
I often think about this, even if, if it's very recent. You all remember in the spring of 2020, when the pandemic struck uh, the world, in March 2020, uh, we didn't know anything, and we were looking at how can we create a vaccine? How long time will it take? Uh, most said three to four years. I know some people in big pharma said, let's say five years to keep the expectations down. But we also know what happened, you know, with less than a year, Pfizer and BioNTech came up with the first vaccine. And I, how they did it, I would say, either it's um, even though or because of. It's 280 components in this vaccine to create it, and from 80 different companies in 19 countries. So when we see a challenge, we see an opportunity. There's also someone paying for it, because there was someone paying for it in this case. We can create magic, I have to say very fast, if we work together. In this case, the skills were from different fields, different technologies, different countries, and so on. But we solved it in less than a year. And I think that one of the reasons to, to do that is, of course, to, to go from, from ego to eco. Uh, I think the panel will talk about this as well, you know, in terms of data or whatever, you know. Instead of you siloing your data, share it, you know. Instead of you siloing your skills and competences, partner with someone. Being part of an ecosystem, and if you build a strong ecosystem, you all will benefit from it instead of just, you know, go, go paving your own way, so to say. And in terms of classic uh, cluster uh, dynamics, the traditional way to see clusters has been the benefits of one sector, very regional activities, aiming towards economic growth. I think that's wrong, and that's what also Monza said in the beginning. I think you should aim instead for, for that you try to solve societal problems, and when you do that with different sectors and skills, and you collaborate and co-create, then you can create economic growth. So you aim for something else. If you aim for economic growth, you will go wrong. If you aim to solve something, you will definitely be right. So in a system, I hope you can see this, classic, you have a, a triple helix, you, you, you combine and you collaborate between industry, academia and society. You make sure that you have a lot of interactions, exchanges and a healthy mobility in between, which means that preferably people will go from healthcare to a company to work for the society and back and forth. It's not that obvious. Most people can go in between companies or in between societal institutions, but you should move in between. At the same time, you want you know, talents and investments coming into your system, and preferably establishments of companies as well, and then you have goods and services going out. But as Orian Solvel and Link Fis is saying, what creates this strong ecosystem is the daily meetings and dense trust-based networks. And also, of course, uh, one of the reasons why I'm here as well and why I collaborate with Biocat and Monse is, of course, international connections and exchanges because that's super important because what you're doing here is inspirational for us and hopefully what we're doing can be inspirational for you and others as well. And that's how a good ecosystem and cluster works. And again, not being limited to the regional capacities and not being limited to your, you know, one sector only. I continue with the, the theories, you know, uh, if you only aim for efficiency and flexibility and you have unrelated activities, yes, then you have a city. You have Barcelona or you have Uppsala. If you instead have unrelated activities and innovation, you have what's called creative regions, or if you aim towards efficiency and flexibility with related activities, industrial districts, while if you combine, you have a cluster. Classic theory, old theory. I have been experimenting with the thoughts that the last five years, what happens if we add digitalization to this, and we add co-creation to that sense. What happens then? And this is, has been the kind of mantra for the organization I worked for a long time. What happens then? We don't know, really. Uh, and just recently, um, I changed it as well. So even if you photograph it, I think you should photograph this instead. Uh, what happens if we change digitalization to, to artificial intelligence, and from co-creation, I'm not saying we shouldn't co-create, to connected uh, activities instead? And then when the goal is about societal impact, I think that's the key to successful development. That would bring home the, you know, the money for your investors as well. So just to sum up, I think there's huge opportunities in the momentum. We have a strong momentum in Sweden. We just need to utilize it. So the, the long tradition from health and medicine and the more modern culture about tech uh, creates opportunities for us. You have other kinds of momentum that you can use or start to create uh, somehow. 
But also, you know, you can combine anything with tech. Um, so we all, we, have, we know that we have, you know, med tech, biotech, whatever, clean tech, ind tech, gov tech, whatever. We can also look at this. Uh, maybe you know about Kevin Kelly. He's the editor in chief for Wired magazine. He said many years ago, you know, just combine anything with AI and you have a company, you know. And I think we, we're way a bit past that. So instead of doing just a simple solution with uh, AI and, and, and um, something else, I think when we work, as I've been, we've been talking about the last 20 minutes, that's when we're successful with AI as well. So with that, I would also like to, to sum up with Alvin Toffler, who's saying that the illiterate of the 21st century is not those who cannot read and write, it's those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I think that's what it's all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, I'd like to focus on that uh, sentence you said about from ego to eco, yeah. because when we were presenting the session, we were thanking all of you for sharing your knowledge. So I think Good. that is what you, what you meant. So thank you, Bjorn.